First of all, it's a gyro plane, not a gyrocopter. And second, if you want to get a rating in one of these things and you look in part 61 of the CFRs, you're going to be really confused because none of it makes any sense. We're going to go over that in a second. Third, I forgot what third was, but it has to do probably with how much fun these are to fly. The one behind me is an ELA Cougar, which is made in Spain. I spent the day here at Blaze Over Me. It's a gyroplane school in Sebastian, Florida, and they specialize in this kind of training. So Rich Lanning is going to tell us what exactly it takes to get the rating if you're doing a transition from a certificate you already have. Rich, I looked in part 61 and I thought I understood what it would take for me, a ATP or a private pilot, to get a category and class rating for a gyroplane. I got it all wrong. <laughs> it's, tell me exactly what's required. Uh, actually, they are, the regulations aren't entirely clear on uh, what's required, and, but basically it's pretty simple. All you need is to meet the requirements of the PTS for sport plane gyroplane, or sport pilot gyroplane, and then you just need to go through the maneuvers with an instructor. When the instructor feels you're competent, they will give you a sign off and a recommendation, and it's basically just in your logbook recommendation. There's no formal FAA paperwork is required. And then you will then have a formal check ride with another gyroplane certified CFI. If they feel you're competent, then you fill out the normal 8710 paperwork submitted to the FAA and you will receive your rating in the mail. Okay, uh, so that's the sport pilot version of it. Correct. Now let's say that uh, I'm a hairy chested uh, helicopter pilot or I want to get uh, uh, the uh, gyroplane category and class rating through the regular FAA process. It's not sport pilot so I can fly at night and the other, other privileges, now what? Right, that's a little more involved. And you mentioned helicopters. So the helicopter actually is already a rotorcraft uh, category. So the requirements are less for a helicopter pilot. A helicopter can transition to a gyroplane really relatively quickly. Uh, for a fixed wing pilot, you're gonna, it's gonna take significantly more hours. Uh, you will have to take a written test and the real distinguisher between the sport pilot is you're also going to have to go through a, a designated examiner to get your check ride. And if I have nothing at all and I'm coming in and I want to do a private pilot gyroplane, then I'm, 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 it's almost like a, a private pilot airplane, right? Correct. You have to do the 40 hours. What all is involved in that? They still have to do cross countries. Uh, there's night flight. They actually, re <laughs> the regulation actually stipulates some instrument time. Um, it's a little struggling how you do instrument time in a gyroplane because uh, they're just not equipped for that. Yeah, I didn't notice any gyros <laughs> in there, correct me if I'm wrong. No, there's not. So uh, I guess we'll, we have to a little improvise, I guess, on part of those. But uh, uh, most people come to us for sport pilot. Um, there really is not a big advantage to getting the regular uh, certification, uh, unless you want to fly at night. That might be the biggest distinguisher. M most of the gyroplanes that are available out here fall under the LSA category, so any sport pilot can fly them. Uh, I doubt you want to go above 10,000 feet in them. Uh, so the restrictions for a sport pilot uh, really aren't, aren't all very uh, uh, onerous. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the transition pilot coming in here, uh, what kind of time it's going to take him to do that. We've typically found that for a transition pilot, if, if they've been actively flying, I mean, that's a big distinguisher, yeah, between 10 and 15 hours. Uh, a lot depends on how frequently they come for training. You know, if you come once a month, it might take longer. You know, if you come once or twice a week, then your transition will be much, much quicker. I mean, the thing we focus on is takeoffs and landings. Because really, once you're up in the air, the gyroplane, with a few exceptions, flies pretty much like an airplane. Uh, so the real trick is taking them off and landing them. And we, we put a lot of emphasis on that. Yeah, and uh, having flown the uh, gyroplanes a little bit, I can attest to that. The, basically in flight and you push the stick this way and you go that way so it's <laughs> relatively simple but the landings are really something else and, and that really takes wrapping your head around a lot of things. It's definitely different than fixed wing. Uh, I fly gliders as well and I kind of, it's a lot like gliders if you uh, fly gliders you know a lot about energy management and that's what we're doing in the gyroplane. We're basically managing the energy in that rotor. That rotor is what's keeping us in the air. As we bleed off that energy from the rotor 
then we're going to land. And we don't typically flare like you do on an airplane, so you don't have that high pitch-up attitude. It's more flat, kind of like a glider. Um, the amazing thing with a gyroplane is, though, when you land, your forward velocity goes to zero almost instantly. That's why these have been typically touted as the safe airplane, because you can land in pretty small areas and with no forward velocity. Okay, well, I'm supposed to go out and fly with Rawl, so I'll get in a gyro plane, go do it. Have fun. Okay, well, maybe it's not that complicated, but the aerodynamics are, at least compared to an airplane, so let's get on with that. If you just think of a gyro plane being exactly like a helicopter, you would have it, well, pretty much all wrong. A gyro plane isn't anything like a helicopter, except in one regard. I'll get to that in a minute. A helicopter has a powered rotor system with blades capable of variable pitch. Because of that, it has a pedal-controlled tail rotor to counteract torque effects. It also has a collective to control blade pitch, which is why flying a helicopter isn't for people who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And hold this thought. A helicopter draws air from above and thrusts it downward. A gyroplane, on the other hand, does none of this, although it does have a rudder to point the nose in the desired direction. A gyroplane's rotor is unpowered, obtaining its rotational energy from the relative wind as the gyro moves forward through the air. The flexible blades are connected to the rotor shaft through a hub bar, which allows the rotor system to teeter. Without this, the imbalance and lift between the advancing and the retreating blade would cause the aircraft to roll over, and that in fact happened in the early gyroplane development. You can think of the gyroplane rotor as a big lifting disc, but it's a little more complicated than that. As with an airplane propeller, the outer portion of the rotor has a higher velocity than either the middle or inner portion, and as the gyroplane moves forward through the relative wind, the angle of attack of the blade changes. The advancing blade has more speed, but a lower angle of attack, while the retreating blade is slower, but has a higher angle of attack. There's a lot of swirling around going on here, and that results in a rotor disc divided into three segments or regions, the driven, the driving, and the stalled. The driven, or outer segment, does the heavy lifting, literally. Its lift vector from the spinning blades is pointed almost straight up. Moving inboard towards the middle of the rotor disc, the lift vector changes from straight up to more forward into the direction of rotation. This is what powers the blades from the relative wind passing through the rotor, and it keeps the rotor spinning. It's similar to auto rotation without power in a helicopter. In the inner or stalled region, the angle of attack of the blades is higher than the stall point, so they contribute no lift at all, only drag, that has to be overcome by the driving segment. Over here on the advancing blade side, the angle of attack is lower, but the speed is much higher, so the driving segment shifts this way because the driven segment is larger. This is where the teetering mechanism comes into play to keep the higher lift on that side from creating a rolling moment. Notice in this clip how the aircraft is noticeably pulsing. This is not due to dynamic imbalance in the rotor blades, but the teetering action of the hub bar balancing uneven aerodynamic lift. It is possible to exceed the rotor system's ability to damp asymmetric lift by flying faster than the never exceed speed in which case an uncommanded roll could occur. There's one other peculiar aspect of gyroplane aerodynamics. In an airplane, if you load the wings by pitching up, the airplane slows down. In a gyroplane, it does the same, but the rotor speeds up because of what's called coning. The rotor's effective diameter decreases like a spinning ice skater pulling her arms in. But the reverse, unloading the disc with aggressive pitch down, causes the rotor to rapidly lose speed. And if this is overdone with sharp negative G at low altitude, it can be unrecoverable. Gyroplanes don't stall, but if slowed up enough, they'll descend at a high sink rate, which means you can land them on a posted stamp, either intentionally or in case of a power loss. That's what we're doing in this clip. 
a maneuver that's a standard part of the flight test. Like helicopters, gyroplanes also have a height velocity curve, which means that at certain combinations of altitude and airspeed, the gyro can't recover rotor energy lost due to an engine failure or unloading, and it will enter an unarrestable descent. A gyroplane has one big advantage if the engine fails and one disadvantage. First, the bad news. The glide ratio is only about 3 to 1 compared to 8 or 10 to 1 in an airplane. So if you're half a mile off the end of the runway, you need to be at about 1,000 feet to reach it. But the gyroplane's advantage is that it can touch down very slowly with little forward movement, which reduces damage or potential injury. Unlike an airplane, a gyroplane doesn't need a long field to land safely. Before you can get to the slightly weird landings, you have to do the slightly weird takeoff. Okay, that requires spinning up the rotor with a device called a pre-rotator just before takeoff. Depending on model, you need around 200 RPM for takeoff. Right there, I will start the pre-rotation. And is that just a clutch that does that? Is uh yeah, is uh, uh this is mechanical, so it's engaging the the pre-rotation. So I know the other one has pneumatic or hydraulic. Uh, so as you feel the, that momentum going, you bring the clutch uh, yeah. further when into it gets, engagement. When it gets to 40, you go all the way in. Okay. And we'll take off at 180. Now it's not going to increase anymore, so we get a little power. Southern traffic, watch out for turn runway 23. One eighty is all you're going to get? Yes, because he has a big rotor. Let me get to one ninety. So now we release, we release the brake. We're going. Keep it there. The RPMs are going to increase. Sebastian area traffic, sky flight 206 is Nose is coming three and up, half right there. To the north More power. of the river, we'll be entering a right space for runway 23, Sebastian. The gyroplane doesn't exactly rotate for takeoff like an airplane, but kind of levitates vertically. It accelerates in ground effect and the rotor continues to spin up until it gets to about 350 RPM. So just after takeoff, the angle is flat until the speed builds and then it climbs at around 1,000 feet per minute. Uh, similar. And one of the things that you do is that you make sure that as soon as the nose goes up, you give it a little more power smoothly. So you keep the nose up and you saw how it lifted. Then you go into ground effect to get to your speed, which will be 65. And that rotation was 50-something? It was, yeah. We were up at uh, 47 uh, miles an hour. Okay. That is when the nose goes up. And goes off the, off, the, off the wheel around that. In maneuvering flight, the gyroplane is little distinguishable from a fixed-wing aircraft. Pitch and roll inputs are the same, and although there's a rudder, the gyro doesn't have ailerons, so it doesn't have adverse yaw. Its version of a coordinated turn is to keep the fuselage aligned with the turn direction. Gyroplanes sometimes have a tuft of yarn taped on the outside of the nose, like a glider. Streamlining that helps to keep the nose properly pointed. Right turns require a little more pedal than left turns, but neither requires much. One thing to get used to is small stick movements by airplane standards. So what we do the first time that we take a student out, if we introduce it to the gyroplane in terms of the flying characteristics. How much movement of the stick do you have to do? Because look, it goes up, so you can just trim a little to go forward. There's very little movement. Yeah. So basically think of you have a dollar coin underneath this, and that is what you move it. So what we're going to do usually with the student is that we tell the student to start thinking ahead of the aircraft, making sure that uh, realize that any changes that you made, there are small changes, it takes three to four seconds. Look, I want to slow down, I just do this, and I wait. Keep it there and look how it goes. Three to four seconds, and then we're at 76. We're a little faster, you just lower the nozzle here, 
and we're going to go down a little and keep it at 700. I don't want to be at the same level of the plane so they don't see us. Although a gyro can't hover like a helicopter, it can fly slow, really slow. Point it into a stiff wind and slow it down and you can park it over a point on the ground. Interestingly, the higher the power a gyro has, the slower it can fly because it has excess thrust to accelerate out of the slow flight condition. You fly the gyro at 65 to 70 miles per hour in the pattern, about like my Cub. Approach speed is about the same, but the pattern is flown tight enough to protect the aircraft's 3 to 1 power off glide ratio. Also, the pattern is flown below fixed wing traffic, so the airplanes can see the gyro better. Landing the gyroplane, an airplane pilot has to resist the urge to flare. Rather, you just hold the flight attitude and fly it onto the runway. In this particular gyro, we used a little power to soften the touchdown. All right, so we're at uh, 65, and slowing down. 206 on the upwind for runway 23. We'll be departing uh, the area to the west, Sebastian. And we're slowing down, giving a little power, a little power, a little power, a little power. Uh, and what's the purpose of the power at the end? Just to soften the, low, the landing, so you don't just... And then to go, to just keep the RPMs in here. And you're softening by getting a little forward speed? A little forward power, yes. I see, okay. If you'd like to learn to fly a gyroplane, Blades Over Me has a hangar full of them in Sebastian, and these guys can show you the ropes. Here's the website. For AvWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching. <laughs>